Hi, it's Monica and let's talk about some diverse fantasy reads. Welcome to an updated version of my diverse fantasy book recommendations. If you haven't seen part one, that video only has recommendations for YA fantasy books, but I will link that up above in the eye and as well in the description box below. I think this video is long awaited for me to make and I wanted to see if my reading tastes have expanded and I am happy to say that I have been reading a lot of new series and I'm going to be talking about some of them in this video. I did enjoy all the books I'm going to be mentioning, but these are mainly based off just the first book, but I'm quite positive that the rest of these fantasy series are going to be great. And let's just get to the first recommendation, which is Six Crimson Cranes by Elizabeth Lim. This is a YA fantasy duology featuring an Asian protagonist set in a world with its own customs, culture, and food, and it's based off Asian mythology. First, it was quite easy to get a grasp onto this world because the writing was very fluid and descriptive, and it also gives off some fairy tale feels from the writing itself. We are following a princess of Kiara, Shiori, and she actually has hidden magic, which is only revealed when she runs away from her wedding ceremony. And the only person who notices is her stepmother. Her stepmother then performs a curse onto her six brothers, transforming them into cranes. And her stepmother threatens Shiori if she speaks or writes of the situation to anyone, there would be dire consequences, meaning she would kill off her brothers. Now Shiori is forced to flee her kingdom and she's also cursed herself to have a bowl on her head that makes her unrecognizable as a princess. She then needs to navigate her way through her kingdom and try to find a way to break this curse and save her people. Through Shiori, we meet many different types of creatures including magical paper cranes and dragons. Shiori as a protagonist is strong and you grow to care for her and you really want her to succeed and save her brothers and her kingdom and break this curse. The one thing about Shiori's character development was that she does follow the typical chosen one trope in a fantasy, but I really did enjoy her realizing that she is a princess, but she learns and interacts with the people of her kingdom, and she understands that she comes from a place of privilege and power, and she learns to humble herself. Another thing in this book that I really liked was the familial love that Shiori has for her siblings. There is also the arranged marriage trope with her betrothed to Khan, and there's a slow burn romance in this book which is not a focal point, which was fine with me. Overall, I do highly recommend this book if you want to learn a little bit more about Asian mythology. And personally, I was very nostalgic for the childhood dishes that were mentioned in this book. And it really made me hungry while reading it. And I'm really excited to get to the sequel. Next up, we have an adult fantasy, which is The City of Brass by S.A. Chakraborty. This book was unique because it explores racial and religious tensions, brewing clan warfare, as well as centuries of Jin history. In this book, we have two different point of views that show us different sides of the Jin world known as Devabad. First, we have Nari, who is a Shafit which means half human, half jinn. At the beginning of the book, we first encounter Nari, who is living in Cairo, Egypt, and making her money through being a con artist and thieving from the rich. She is sharp, witty, and she is able to grift her way out of quite sticky and tough situations. Nari also has the ability to heal and speak the ancient dead language of the jinn. Her character has a very strong start, but then this changes when she meets a Devabad warrior, Jin warrior named Dara. This is when her independence is placed on the back burner as she learns about the world of the Devabad, the Jin, and as well as leaning on Dara to be her support. There is a romance between Dara and Nari that is growing, and although I did enjoy that, I felt it did take away from Nari's growth as a character, but she does learn to detach herself from that near the end of the book, so I'm glad for that. Our second point of view is from the point of view of Ali, who is a Devabad prince, and he's very devout to his religion, he's a Muslim, and he really 
dislikes the harm that is being done against Shafiq in Devabad. Ali is very a sharp contrast to Nahri because he grew up in a world of privilege and power. He is also a trained warrior and he has a really cool magical fire sword. His point of view does bring us into the world of politics of the jinn and how complex they are. And Ali being the second son of a king, he struggles to uphold the wishes of his father. His character is one who is quite consistent throughout the book and he's very stuck on his morals which is good, but I do believe that he will have more growth in book two. I did want to speak about the world building in this book, and although it is admittedly slow, it is such a rich and full and lush world that we learn about the jinn and other magical creatures. I did enjoy learning about the political and cultural tensions in this world, and I really like how that there is Middle Eastern settings as well as Muslim rap and POC main characters. Overall, I do think the City of Brass does deliver on Jin mythology, political intrigue, lush world building, and characters that you can cheer on. And next up is another YA series that I have been talking a lot on my channel, and this is Legendborn by Tracy Dion. So this one, we are set in the campus of the University of North Carolina and we're following 16-year-old Bree Matthews who has discovered that there is a secret society on campus named Legendborn who hunt after demons. And Bree has a mysterious connection to them through her dead mother. Legendborn is a book full of many deep topics such as racism, colonialism, slavery, discrimination, as well as standing up for yourself and learning to overcome grief and trauma. And it also has great POC and LGBTQ plus rep. First, the magic system was a really nice take on King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. The simple explanation for the magic in this world is that the magic source itself is either called ether or root depending on who is talking about the magic in the book and there are layers upon layers of magic in this world. With the magic itself, we learn about the secret society, the legend born, but they are part of a larger society called the Order. And the Order has a lot of white colonial roots and I really love Brie charging in and making a stand and disrupting the, their status quo. Also, with Legendborn, there is dark academia setting elements such as the university setting, we have supernatural powers as well as demons attacking and impending magical war. Basically, all the elements that I do want in a dark academia book. Although this book does have a lot of fantastical elements, we are rooted in true American history with the discussion of slavery and colonialism and we do learn through that through Brie's story. On the topic of Brie, she is one that is defiant, stubborn, and observant, and she does make mistakes along the way, but she does own up to them. The main thing for Brie in this book is that she's trying to tackle healing from the grief and trauma from her mother's death. To say the least, it is not going well for her because grief is not pretty, it's not simple, and we do really see the complex layers of that in Brie's perspective. Along the way, Brie does meet some unique individuals including Nick and Selwyn. These two are quite a vital part to the story and possible romances. Nick is a legend born and he very quickly becomes a grounding figure for Brie for her introduction into the legend born world but he also deals with anger issues from his childhood. Selwyn is a very powerful mage and he loves his magic and he loves a really good fight. He also has anger issues from his past. All three of these characters have multi-layered and complex friendships and relationships that do develop throughout Legendborn as well as the sequel Blood March that I have recently read. And I do think there is a book three coming out soon. And for Legendborn, I just absolutely love how everything was interwoven and connected and I just think everything was very well crafted and written so I do really highly recommend this one as well. Next up we have Jade City by Fonda Lee. This is a adult urban fantasy series. Jade City is about two crime syndicate families who control the island of Kekon. 
We follow the Call family who have green bones among their ranks, who are warriors that wear jade that grant them superhuman abilities. But the Calls and their rivals are really at odds with each other and with growing tensions that could only mean a clan war is coming. With this being a urban fantasy, I really thought the blend between the technology, guns and cars, as well as the supernatural element being the jade was not over jarring and we're set on an island that has Asian influences in its customs, culture, and other traditions. And I think the best part of this first book for me, Jade City, was the growing tensions between the two clans. The Cole family are from the No Peak clan and then their rivals are called the Mountain clan. So these two are having like small skirmishes against each other, poking at each other, and it grows the tension until we reach the actual clan war. Essentially, you don't know who to trust and any character can betray our main characters and this really did remind me of Peaky Blinders because anyone who is against the family or the gang is the enemy. In this book, we do follow multiple point of views of the Call family members and we're following three siblings, Lan, Hilo, and Shay, and we also follow a point of view of their cousin, Anden. Each point of view is well balanced and distinct from each other. They of course have complex family dynamics and they have sibling rivalry and jealousies going on. The other thing I really did enjoy was the clan structure itself. There is like the leader and then you have the business head and then the crime head and I really like how each part of the leadership of the clan shows a type of balance to the gang that one side can be diplomatic while the other side is acting with violence. The writing itself was very descriptive and really puts you into the world. It's super immersive. My favorite character really does have to be Hilo and Shay. Hilo, he is someone who is being pulled in many different directions and he can be a little bit unhinged at times. While Shay, she really goes against family tradition and like clan tradition and her being really the only woman in power in her family at this time. She's like defying all the men and I love that for her. And with those different competing conflicts, we do see many different layers of the characters and the complex relationships of a clan and how that goes into that clan war. And I'm really excited to continue the series. I have only read the first book, but I know I need to make it a goal to finish series in 2023. <laughs> and my last recommendation is another YA duology and it is Spin the Dawn by Elizabeth Lynn. This book is described as Project Runway meets Mulan. The protagonist Maya dreams of becoming the best tailor in the land. But in the kingdom of Alandi, only boys can compete for the really coveted position of the imperial tailor. When a royal summons her father, who is a tailor but has failing health, to court, Maya takes it upon herself to disguise herself as a boy and she goes to court to compete in that competition to be, to be the imperial tailor. Right away, we do have that Project Runway and Mulan aspects, but the retelling of Mulan, the author takes her own twist on it and I really enjoyed how she did that. Maya does have a tragic past and now she's in a position that she can help her family to also hone her talent to make beautiful clothes. I would describe her as being resourceful, intelligent, strong, and also having a sense of wonder. And she is very much the driving force of this book. In the competition for the Imperial Tailor itself, it was very much like Project Runway. There was a lot of unexpected challenges and also maybe some backstabbings, like life and death backstabbings. It was very fun to read about the different challenges that Maya needs to go through, but in the royal palace, this is where we meet our love interest, Eden. Eden is the enchanter who works very closely with the emperor in a land where magic is very rare. He's one that grows on you as a reader and same for Maya. Eden is observant, arrogant, but also very mysterious and very helpful to Maya. Their romance is one that takes center stage in this book, but I really did enjoy how their relationship developed and Maya does eventually learn to grow on her own, like apart from Eden. 
Also, Aiden isn't very overbearing towards her, but he's a very useful resource for Maya as well to navigate politics and court intrigue and all that since Maya is very new to the environment. The world of Alandi is very rich and intense with Chinese influences and the writing really made it very expansive. Overall, Spin the Dawn is a story that takes you through an adventure throughout Alandi and we see through Maya that she has great growth and determination to accomplish her goals. Those were all the series I wanted to mention today in today's video. I hope you enjoyed this video and maybe you added a book or two to your TBR. And if you've read any of these book series, comment down below what you did think about them. And with that, I'm going to say thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to give me a huge thumbs up, hit that subscribe button down below, and ring the notification bell to not miss any future uploads. And I'll see you all in my next video. Bye!